So today, I'm going to be sharing what I know, uh, what I've experienced. Uh, I'm hoping to give you tools, some tips, uh, and loads of information to be able to look at, to reflect on uh, what is being presented to us today. Uh, we, I ask that you uh, remain uh, with an open mind. Uh, I ask you to open your eyes and your ears and listen. Listen from your heart, listen from your spirit. Uh, much of the knowledge we have about sex still comes through the patriarchal lens. So we kind of want to shift that lens into a more matrifocal, or shall I say, a balanced, uh, non-dualistic uh, angle. And perhaps we can start looking at sexuality in today's world through that lens rather than through the, um, uh, well, I don't want to say perverted, but uh, yeah, perverted meaning twisted patriarchal lens. It has been twisted. It has been perverted in order to control others. So the first thing we need to think about and what we want to talk about is our immediate and present way of looking at sexuality. Is sex sacred to you? Do you find that sex is sacred or is it just uh, a, a conquer and get off type thing? You know, is it, you know, what is, what is, what is sexuality? So Treva, what about you? Do you think that sex is sacred? I believe that it is, and I also believe that it should be. <laughs> Good. Thank because you. I've had a, quite a different view on sex since I was growing up. Because, you know, when you're in high school, you're a teenager, everybody wants to get laid. Yep. Even when you're a young adult or people are always going out trying to get, you know, trying to go and hook up <laughs> hook up find a partner but for me it's it's like all it's just all about it's it's different you know for myself i've never been into just like you know the whole like conquer and get, 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 yeah. get, get off for me like being intimate with someone is is much more sacred you know absolutely absolutely and you, and you said a very important word that we seem to have forgotten um, intimacy. Uh, a lot of us have lost the intimacy. A lot of us have lost the emotional and spiritual aspect of it. So uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, I also feel that sex is sacred. Um, I, of course, in my 20s, I was, you know, typical, pretty 20 year old trying to get as many partners as I can. And, uh, you know, when spirituality and your awakening starts to happen, you start realizing that it's so much more than that. So Let's ask ourselves, you know, if we think sex is sacred, then yes, it is. But what if in our world today, what would it be like if sex was considered sacred? What would the world look like if sex was considered sacred? Um, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit, and then, Treva, you tell me what you think. But for me, I, I, if sex was considered sacred, I don't believe that we would have as much um, predatory uh, issues uh, dealing with rape, uh, dealing with um, illegal prostitution, uh, the underbelly of, of sex being looked at as something to be ashamed of. Uh, I do believe that um, sex would be, uh, it would just be a part of life. It'd just be a part of nature, which is what it is. But if sex were considered to be sacred, it would just be a part of the fabric of life and not be shunned or 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 make us blush or make us giggle, you know, <laughs> when we're talking about it. Uh, I I do believe a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the attacks against women and or even uh, children, perhaps. I think I don't want to go into a whole pedophilia thing, but I I think that that might have something to do with it as well. It's it's turning it into this twisty dark ugly thing, uh, perhaps if it was considered sacred and a part of the fabric of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, it wouldn't be uh, so perverted uh, or so many like crazy things going on. What do you think the world would be like, Treva, if sex was considered sacred? Um, I kind of believe um, that men and women and 
everybody in between would be considered equal. There wouldn't be any people, there wouldn't be any like whole, like I kind of believe there wouldn't be any like homophobia or transphobia. Yeah. There may not, it, it, this may even go into there, there may not be even, even stuff like racism and stuff because it could like, I guess, bleed over into that. And I also believe that if sex and sexuality was considered sacred, we probably wouldn't have as much as seven billion people on this planet. That's true. Overpopulation. Maybe. That's a good, that's a very good point. I never thought of that. Cool. Thank you. So as we move as we move further into this discussion of sacred sexuality, the other aspect we need to look at is our body. Um, so many of us have issues with our bodies. So many of us uh, don't respect our bodies. Uh, so we need to ask ourselves: Do we honor? Do we honor our body? Do we honor our body? And if we don't, what is keeping us from honoring? Our body. Our body is the vessel for your spirit to incarnate, for your life to be lived in. Uh, so many of us, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, sex addiction is a good example. People that have sex addiction, to me, are not honoring their body. I understand that it is an addiction and, and that is a whole nother scenario, but I feel that that might stem from not honoring your body. If our if our bodies are sacred, perhaps we wouldn't you know share it so freely, <laughs> for lack of a better term, or um, for that matter, put drugs into it. Um, sometimes many of us who don't honor our body are are doing forms of escapism. Uh, we have to ask ourselves: Do we feel present in our body? Can we feel present in our body or do we try to escape it with diversions, drugs, noise, loud music, uh, business? You know, uh, can we be comfortable in our body? And that has a lot to do with the sacredness of sexuality. Yes, it goes together. If we are in our body and we honor our body, we can be in our mind, we can be in our body. And therefore, our lives become more mindful and more sacred. So how do you feel about that, Treva? Do, do you feel you honor your body? And if not, what keeps you from honoring your body? And I think you're a great example of honoring your body, quite honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I guess in my transition, yes, uh, sexuality, you know, sex is yes, because, you know, I don't really go out there looking for my next conquest which is the which is what the which is what men are pretty much brainwashed to do these days or not all men but most men and there are some ways that I don't honor my body you know but sometimes like some of the food that I put in my body you know but you know that's that's for a whole different show I guess yeah yeah but that and, is a part of it mm -hmm. that is a part of it that's great. So for those of you listening, ask yourself, do you honor your body? If not, what is keeping you from honoring your body? And do you feel present in your body? Or do you try to escape your body through diversions, drugs, noise, and business? We're going to go ahead and move on to the next part where we're going to go into the time in human history when sex was sacred. This is who we were. We as a human race, long before a Christian God and patriarchal religions, which actually started prior to Christianity, uh, we encounter a world where for a millennia, people worshipped the goddess. People worshipped the divine feminine, a benevolent, fertile, and above all, very, very sexual she was the great mother. She was fertility. The, the religion itself, these religions, much of it, revolved around fertility practices and the magic of fertility. In ancient times, the worship of the divine was often conducted through sexual rites. Uh, we see and as we see it now, you know, some of the modern pagan 
uh, rituals that we see, for example, like Beltane, uh, May Day. Those of you that don't know what Beltane is, May Day, that maypole, what do you think that maypole represents? What do you think the ribbons wrapping around that pole that is plunged into the earth represent? Uh, I, I've seen games, and I joke about it because it's a fun game. There's a game that we played at uh, Blue Ridge Beltane several years ago where there's a big circle, a big hoop that represents the womb of the mother. And they have these bean bags with little streamers that literally look like sperm. And the game was to throw as many sperm bean bags through the, 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 the hoop of the, uh, of the mother womb. Uh, so back then, of course, people weren't so... Uh, how shall we say bashful? Uh, don't get me wrong. There was, you know, we weren't as evolved, perhaps, in a lot of uh, sexual. Well, I don't know. Again, that to me, I'm kind of judging, so I'm not going to judge. Let me say without judgment that in these ancient times, a lot of sexual rights were a part of the worship of the mother, um, a priest and priestesses. Uh, we had what were called sacred prostitutes, which were not considered. Um, they were not considered uh, sex workers. They were not considered um, lower in the scale of the social caste, for lack of a better term. They represented the 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 sexual magic, the sexual energy of 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 the mother. And of course, we had it with males as well. Uh, we had fertility rights. We had sex magic. Um, we had initiation and coming of age. All, all of these uh, were, were surrounding the whole sexual nature of the goddess cultures. Uh, even homosexuality uh, was celebrated as having divine feminine and masculine energies and balance. Uh, even in modern uh, magical uh, sex magic, which maybe some of you guys know about Tantra and the Kama Sutra and all that, even then the polarities do not necessarily need to be male or female. It is about the divine sexual energy. Sex was believed to lead to enlightenment. So for those of you who have ever truly been in love uh, and have actually made love. And I don't know how many people out there can actually say they've made love, connecting spirit to spirit in the most intimate way with another human being. That was actually considered a form of awakening, a form of enlightenment to truly make love, to share your chi energy or your tantric energy, whatever quote-unquote word, label you want to use, sharing that energy was considered a form of uh, enlightenment, of meditation, of practice to awaken. Uh, if you study anything about um, Tantra or Kama Sutra or even modern sex magic, it's not about the sex. It's about the raising of one's consciousness to transcend the ego to transcend the bodily desire while utilizing the sexual energy to bring you to that higher level of consciousness. Uh, nothing back then had shame or perversion. In that culture, sexuality was not shameful. It was not considered perverted. We in the West seem to carry a lot of shame and sometimes feel dirty, which might lead to perversion. <laughs> we feel we carry a lot of this garbage around. We've been programmed to believe all of this garbage of shame. Uh, geez, uh, what was it? I forgot if it was in the 17th century, 18th century. People weren't allowed to take a bath because they weren't allowed to get naked because God would see them naked. Talk about shameful. And you, you can only imagine how bad people stunk back then. And I'm sure you've all heard about, you know, the stinky, uh, the stinky 1700s or 1600s or whatnot, uh, because they were afraid to share, to show their body to God. And it was considered a sin to take a bath. That is how much shame uh, was, was being thrown at our culture through these patriarchal religions. That did not exist. 
Now, this worship of the goddess, the goddess culture, the divine feminine focal uh, cultures lasted for over 30,000 years. The patriarchy is only about, what, five, 6,000 years? Some people might uh, disagree with me. For, but from what I, my understanding and my research, uh, we're, we're talking maybe 5,000, 6,000 years uh, when the patriarchy took over, when the, the, the worship of the mother goddess turned into the worship of the sky god. And the god became in control. And we saw that. Uh, we see this even in ancient Greece, where all of a sudden uh, the goddesses were made subservient to, uh, for example, like Zeus. Uh, Zeus gave birth to Dionysus from his knee. How, that's not very natural. Whereas in the old cultures, uh, it was the goddess that gave birth to the gods. It was the goddess that gave birth to the earth, to the world, which to me feels more natural. <laughs> I think a woman giving birth through her, you know, her feminine organs seems to make seems to make more sense than, well, and no offense to those that believe in the mythology of the of the first testament than, you know, Adam giving birth to Eve uh, because God took a rib out. Uh, the idea of the divine feminine giving birth to life uh, seems to make more sense to us if you rare sex was something that was celebrated. And this culture lasted for over 30,000 years. The patriarchy is only 5,000 years old. The demise of the goddess cultures, uh, probably between 4,000 to 2,500 BCE, uh, happened with three waves of proto-Indo-European uh, ruled invasions. They were ruled by priests and warriors from Northern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, they descended into Europe, uh, the Near East, and India, and along with that brought their sky god, uh, patriarchal, uh, aggressive, assertive. Well, not assertive. It was aggressive. It was warlike. Uh, they invaded. They literally invaded. Uh, archaeo archaeological evidence shows these patterns of disruption in these ancient uh, goddess cultures. They, they, there are patterns of invasions, uh, again, happening in three waves during this time. Uh, villages were literally burned to the ground. Uh, people were sold into slavery and exploited. Uh, that's not to say that the goddess cultures were perfect, but this type of human as commodity did not exist. It was an egalitarian culture, an agra agrarian culture, where everyone worked together for the unity and for the good of their village of their community and again here we have these patriarchal you know invasions coming in uh what happened is the cosmology began to change and i touched on that a little bit earlier um, male gods replaced female goddesses in importance and prestige uh, no longer was the goddess equal to the god no longer was the mother the giver of life, suddenly the male gods began to see the female gods, goddesses as subservient, thus giving the idea that it was okay in culture to see female or feminine as weak. Uh, we see it happening to Tiamat by Marduk. Uh, we see it happening to in the story of Gaia by Uranus. Uh, goddesses were renamed. Uh, many of them were turned into demons. And if you seek, if you research this, many of these so-called um, grimoires, for lack of a better term, even in the Key of Solomon, we see it. Uh, these patriarchal grimoires of high magic and whatnot. These goddesses, like Astarte or Esther, they're called demons. They're no longer life givers. They are no longer the fertile, loving powerful essences of universal principle, they have been called demons. The powers split off, distributed to other goddesses. Uh, they were diluted. 
all their power being diluted by any one goddess demoted to daughters. They were demoted to wives. The mythology completely erased the, the power of the goddess, making her subservient to the male god. Uh, Hera became the nagging, jealous wife. Uh, Aphrodite became the adulteress. Artemis, the warrior goddess of the moon, became the daughter. Uh, Hecate, uh, the goddess of the witches, became the old crone and the guardian of the underworld. Uh, on Earth, the power passed from women uh, over their own fates to their fathers, to their husbands, and even their sons. No longer were women cons allowed to have property. No longer were women allowed to own land, where in that culture, everything was once passed down the mother's line. You know, the, there, we, there was the matriarch, and that would be passed down to the next, uh, next woman in line. Uh, we see remnants of it in certain cultures where, uh, well, for example, in, in uh, many, many Latin cultures, we'll see remnants of it where uh, the, the mother's name is still kept, uh, like um, mine would be uh, Alvarez de Echeverria, you know, from the mother's maiden, uh, maiden name. So that we see remnants of it. But all in all, the, the mother, the woman, her power was stripped. Uh, women became pawns in political games. Uh, women's reproductive rights were stolen as gods became the creator. As I mentioned earlier, suddenly Athena is sprung from Zeus's head. <laughs> so Zeus is giving birth out of his knee to Dionysus. He's giving birth out of his head uh, to Athena. And of course, we have Eve being birthed out of a rib from the side of Adam. Uh, and, and just on a side note, I have to go into this. I, I, I can't mention Adam and Eve without mentioning Lilith. Uh, those of you that know the story of Lilith, Lilith was made, uh, quote unquote, in the mythology story. Uh, she also was made from the dirt, equal to Adam, but she wouldn't submit to him. So she was cast out of the Garden of Eden for not being a good wife. And suddenly, uh, Earth, uh, I mean, uh, Eve is created from the rib of Adam. God, again, God said to have fastened Eve from Adam's rib. Eve was forced into submissiveness. Uh, in the Bible, it says, if God tells Adam, if she does not submit to you, kick her with your heel. You know, hit her in the face with your heel or step on her face, something ridiculous like that. Uh, she was blamed. Again, this is the modern version of what has happened. Uh, Eve is blamed with the fall of humanity, and therefore all women for thousands of years were seen as the reason why men fell from grace, and this suffering has been going on for thousands of years. Uh, marriage... Uh, Marriage became a necessity for women, for protection. That marriage became a necessity for women so that they may have, um, so that they may have property, so that they may have a home. And quite honestly, a woman's sexuality, in many cultures to this day, we see it with um, genital mutilation in many Middle Eastern countries. Women aren't allowed to enjoy sex or weren't allowed to enjoy sex. Women were considered good for one thing, Procreation. Uh, this is when we start seeing the profane aspects of, of sexuality beginning to emerge. Uh, prostitution begins to flourish. You know, I, again, it is looked at as profane, as dirty, no longer sacred. Uh, sexual energies of the goddess, ritual, healing, regeneration was lost. It was abolished. You could be killed in many cultures for 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 having a sexual uh, promiscuity as a woman to this day. Final victories of this transition, Christianity became the law and women lost all their rights. The feminine became weak, was seen as weak, and homosexuality 
suddenly became a sin. So where are we today? Where are we today? I just shared a story of when sex was sacred, when women were sacred, when homosexuality was not a sin, when sexuality was celebrated, and we see the transition of the patriarchy coming in, submissing all things feminine, creating sex into a profane, uh, ex exiled as profane, for lack of a better term. So where are we today? We're seeing a shift. We are seeing the divine feminine uh, energies returning to the earth. We are seeing more and more goddess cultures uh, being re-envisioned. Uh, Neo-paganism is a great example of that, uh, trying to rebuild upon the ancient uh, goddess cultures with the same ancient uh, principles and morality of, of these cultures. And I do see that as something better, personally speaking. Uh, sacred sex in the 21st century is suddenly big business. And the goddess looms large as we revisit the past to uncover the roots of traditions that honor her. We're seeing her now, we're seeing the sacredness of sexuality blossoming and exploding in the Neo-Tantra that offers a stylized Western experience for those that want to heal their relationships and experience a full body orgasm. Ooh, I said the word orgasm. Ooh. <laughs> a full body orgasm. How many people have had a full body orgasm? And what does it take to achieve a full board body orgasm? It's returning to the sacredness, returning and allowing the sexuality to be an integral part of our very being. We find her in Wiccan or shamanic ritual or in pagan magical sex magic or pagan sex magic. She is nature herself speaking to you through the ayahuasca drug. She is the healing found through a sex surrogate or in the arms of a modern day sacred prostitute. Many people laugh at the idea of sexual surrogacy or sacred prostitution. Many people don't understand the necessity of our collective consciousness to heal these wounds that we have, have been thrust upon us for thousands of years. There is work to be done and we must be open to the idea of healing these wounds. The goddess is the rising kundalini serpent awakened in an ecstatic dance class. Whatever path you wish to traverse, the untamable, powerful sexual energy of the goddess is awakening. And this is the opportunity we have to reawaken that within us, whether you are male, whether you are woman, whether you are gay, whether you are straight, whether you're bi, whether you're transgender, this energy, this sacred energy is going to heal us. It will help us become whole once again. What is the Kama Sutra? So many of us talk about the Kama Sutra, and, and I, got, I remember as a teenager having a copy of the Kama Sutra and giggling at every every page. <laughs> and I have found that while the Kama Sutra, uh, you know, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, it's presumed as uh, creative sexual positions, but the reality of it is that the Kama Sutra is not about great sex. It, for lack of a better term, we could call it the yoga of sex. The Kama Sutra is probably in reality about 20% sexual. I mean, 20% of it is probably about sexual positions. The rest of it is about moving the chi, moving the energy, moving the prana, connecting that prana, the wholeness, the intimacy, the connection of the two people. So 
when you are looking for great positions, I would probably suggest uh, getting the joy of sex <laughs> because the Kama Sutra is going to make you or, or hopefully inspire you to bring energy into it. Bring energy back into your sex life. Bring energetic connection back into the act of lovemaking. Bring love back into the art of lovemaking. And of course, in the 21st century, we hear much about Tantra and Tantrika and uh, Tantric sex and, and et cetera, et cetera. A tantra, tantric religion is an ancient Indian tradition of beliefs and meditation and ritual practices that seeks to channel the divine energy of the macrocosm or, you know, the Godhead, into the human macro microcosm. So again, it is about utilizing our consciousness to bring the energy through our bodies and hopefully share that with our partners. And what about sex magic? We hear a lot about sex magic, uh, you know. Unfortunately, Aleister Crowley really kind of screwed it up for everybody, but it really is not evil. <laughs> Sex magic is the art, again, of utilizing archetype, utilizing uh, chi energy, exchanging energy. And if, 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 depending on what it is that you're trying to do, for me personally, I, actually, I'll share what it is for me personally, but I'll give you an aside in just a moment. For me personally, sex magic is about raising yourself to that point of connecting with your higher self. It's the ecstasy of elevating our consciousness through ritual uh, sexual practice. Um, it's not, it can be, it can be, this is the aside I was gonna mention, it can be utilized to, to raise energy. You know, we talk a lot about in paganism and Wicca about raising the cone of power. Yes, sex can be utilized to raise energy and direct it to a specific outcome. Uh, so if, you know, well, I'll give you a cute example. It's Valentine's Day. <laughs> Let's say uh, you and your, your partner are, are, are wanting to get a new car for your anniversary. Visualize the car. Think about the car and, and raise the energy through your bodies and direct it to manifesting that car. And I know that's kind of a, a cheap, a, a cheap way of looking at it, but I'm just trying to give you a, a simple, a, a simple um, example of that. So yes, yeah, sexual magic is about raising the energy through ecstasy to an intended outcome. For me, it is always about aligning with my higher self, being able to get to that ecstatic state of of connection with source, with with. Uh, uh, with higher self, with the archetypal self, etc. Energy sex. This is another one uh, that uh, many people talk about. Energy sex can be utilized, actually everything can be utilized positive or negatively, but energy sex is the same, pretty similar along the lines as, let's say, uh, Tantra or Kama Sutra work. Uh, you're, you're changing energy, you're uh, you're connecting with your partner on an intimate level and you're sending your chi energy into them and they are uh, absorbing your chi energy. Think of it like Reiki sex, for lack of a better term. Full body Reiki sex, giving energy, the other person receiving the energy and then again, uh, changing that around and then you receiving the energy and them giving the energy. Uh, a perverse way of looking at it you may have heard of is vampire sex, very similar uh, to those that are into the dark arts, uh, but they do it without permission and they draw the energy of their partner in, uh, and drain them of their life force energy. But yes, uh, energy sex is sex with your life force energy, giving it, receiving it. And the sacred union, what is the sacred union? Um... It's going to be different for everybody. I can only share with you what I feel about the topic. 
to me, the sacred union is the, uh, how shall I say, the, the transcendence of the dualistic nature of our spirit. When I, a good example, if I'm doing energy magic, or I mean sex magic or energy uh, sex, for me, it is about the sacred union. It is about transcending the physical form, the energy from the higher self, connecting with the energy of the higher self and, and uniting with that of the other person that you are with. Uh, it doesn't need to be feminine energy. It doesn't need to be masculine energy. And I guess I might as well say now before it's too late because the show's almost over. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're male, female, Male, male, female, female, feminine male and masculine male. It doesn't need to have that. It doesn't matter. Not In this type of higher realm of sacred sexuality, it's genderless. And it doesn't have to be dualistic. If we can raise our elevation and raise our consciousness to the level of transcending duality, that is where the sacred union begins to happen. That is when the sacred union of your divine masculine and feminine unite with the divine masculine and feminine of your partner. And again, I implore you to please question everything that I've said. <laughs> I think it hope that I have given you uh, food for thought. I believe that uh, it, this is a time where we must get over the westernized, bastardized version of sexuality, get over ourselves, so to speak. And it's time to bring back the divine feminine aspects within ourselves, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're transgender, find that balance, restore the sacredness into your sexuality. It is about respecting yourself. It is about respecting your body. And it, by all means, it is about respecting the act of lovemaking. So being that it's Valentine's Day, if you're going to be with someone tonight, <laughs> try some of these tips that I offered you. Try to connect more intimately. Try to share your life force energy and receive their life force energy. Be respectful. Be whole. Be beautiful. Be of source and be of love. For yes, sex is sacred. Sex has always been sacred. Let's re reclaim the sacredness of all. Well, please, if you enjoy my show, uh, we are in need right now of some help. So if you can, please do make a donation. You can go to bernardalvarez.com slash give. Or you can become one of my sponsors, and that would be great also. Go to patreon.com slash Bernard Alvarez. We love you, everyone. Have a wonderful week.